Einstein was once asked to consider the question of what would happen if the sun suddenly disappeared. Physicists say that because of the distance from the sun to the earth, that it would take about 8 minutes and 20 seconds before we noticed that the sun disappeared. After 8 minutes and 20 seconds, there would be sudden darkness over the face of the earth. There would be very little natural light. The only natural light that we would receive on this planet, if the sun were to disappear, would be the light that we receive from the stars. And so there would be darkness over the face of the planet. Photosynthesis in plants would end immediately, and most every plant on the planet would begin to die. After the first week of the earth not having the sun, the average temperature on the surface of the earth would be 32 degrees. After the first year of having no sun, the average temperature on the face of the earth would be negative 100 degrees. The oceans would freeze over. The land would be more like a massive frozen rock. And 99% of the organisms on our planet are somehow dependent on the sun for energy or light. If there were no sun, there would be widespread death. Without the gravitational pull of the sun, the earth would, the solar system would just break apart and the earth would just be flung out into the cosmos and the probability of our planet colliding with another celestial body would go up exponentially. It's safe to say that the sun is important to our planet. And in Psalm 19, David opens up with a celebration of the way the sun brings glory as a testimony to God. He says the sun is a testimony of the faithfulness of God. The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaim His handiwork. Day to day pours out speech and night to night reveals knowledge. God is faithful. He celebrates that the, the Son makes a declaration that God's revelation is audible. It is visible. He says, verse 3, there's no speech. There's no words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth. And the words to the end of the world, in them He has set a tent for the Son. The Son proclaims that our God is beautiful. He says he's like a, the sun is like a, a bridegroom that's coming out to receive its bride. It, it comes with purpose and with confidence. And he, he says it's like a, a wedding procession. He says, uh, verse 5, in which the, he comes out like a bridegroom receiving his chamber, like a strong man runs its course with joy. The, the sun rise and the sun set. This incredibly beautiful display of colors. And the sun never slows down in its beauty. It, it never halts in its majesty. It comes up with confidence in the morning. It sets its course in the day. And it sets with beauty in the night. It's like a groom going to receive its bride. We have a God who is beautiful. And the sun declares that our God is powerful. He is essential. He says, verse 6, it's rising from the end of the heavens. It's circuit to the end of them. There is nothing hidden from its heat. The sun says every single day that our God is faithful our God is powerful, our God is beautiful, our God is essential. And after reflecting on the vital nature of the sun to our planet, he then turns his attention to say, like the sun is essential to our planet, so is the Word of God to every human soul. 
And then he offers a reflection on the Word of God from verses 7 through 11. And I want you to note this. He gives us six synonyms for the Word of God. Six things that you can call the Bible. He calls the Bible the law, the testimony, precepts, commandments, the fear of the Lord, and the rule of God. For every synonym, there is a quality of the Word of God. The Word of God is perfect, sure, right, pure, clean, and true. Because of the quality of the Word of God, it does something important to the human soul. It revives, it makes wise, it rejoices the heart, it enlightens the eyes, it endures forever, and it makes one righteous. And just as we would either wake up in the morning, and maybe not for some of you early risers, some of you would say the sunset is just as pretty as the sunrise. But however you like it, just like we would gaze at a beautiful sunset or a magnificent sunrise, I want us to just take a step back in reference to the Word of God, and I want you to gaze at each of these statements, the synonym, the quality, and the effect on the human soul. Verse 7, he says, The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The law of the Lord can refer to either the entire Word of God, the law of the Lord can refer to a part of the Word of God, it can refer to a passage in the Word of God. The law of the Lord can refer to even a word in the Word of God. But however you break it down, the same quality applies to all of it. From one word to the entire word, it is perfect. It will not lead you astray. It will not bring you into error. You will not go the wrong way following the Word of God. But you and I, just like that old hymn says, I am prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. If you want anything that will bring you into check, that will make you come back right with God, he says, it will revive you. We live in error, but the Word of God can revive the soul and bring us back to God. He says in verse 7, the second part, The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The testimony of the Lord speaks of the covenants of God. You and I live under the new covenant. The Word of God tells us how to have a relationship with God. It tells us that God has given His Son to die for the sinner. That it's through His broken body and His spilt blood that you and I enter into a new covenant with God through repentance and faith. We must receive Jesus Christ as our Savior, and under the new covenant, the Holy Spirit comes to indwell the believer so that now every moral action and choice that we have is measured by living for Christ. And if we do that, it makes us wise. It shows us how to make great daily decisions. It shows us how to make the best possible choices. If you want to know how to live life, we live by the sure testimonies of the Lord. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The precepts of the Lord are the purposes of God. It's the things He has declared. The precepts mean God has declared this is the way the world is going to work. A precept means if you make this choice, it will reap this consequence. The precept means this is what God's will is for the world and also your life. And that will rejoice your heart because there is no question on how to live. 
He has made it plain to us. And that's right. It means it's not hidden from us. We don't have to guess about it. It's going to lead us to the right path. And it makes us joyful whenever we can live for the Lord and we know what the Lord expects of us. The commandments of the Lord are pure. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The commandments of the Lord speak to all of the commandments of God in their entirety. And you realize there are not just ten commandments in the Bible. There are hundreds of commandments in the Bible. From thou shalt not kill to do not forsake the assembling of yourselves as the manner of some is. From do not take the Lord's name in vain to rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. All the commandments are pure. That means they are unstained. They are essential truths. The commandments of the Lord are unpolluted. They enlighten the eyes. Listen, following the commands of the Lord help you to see life differently than anybody else can see it. It gives you a special insight into life that you cannot perceive any other way except by the Word of God. The fear of the Lord. He says the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The fear of the Lord means that everything you do is an act of worship. The fear of the Lord is reverential awe. The fear of the Lord sweeps away all hidden places from our lives. It sweeps away all secret things from our souls. The the fear of the Lord means I ever live before God. And the Fear of the Lord endures forever. That's the only thing that matters in life. It's the one essential secret to everything. It's the key to all things for us to live forever in the fear of the Lord. It endures forever. The rules of the Lord are true, righteous altogether. The rules of the Lord are His rulings, His decisions. We live in a culture of so much distraction and deception. If you want to know what is true, take what you see and compare it to what the Word of God says. You'll never go wrong. You you can't be deceived. This is the essence of all things. As important as the sun is to the earth... So the Word of God is to the human soul. Lifeway Discipleship did a study last year and revealed amongst Protestant churchgoers, which would be kind of us, 32% of us read the Bible every day. Only a third. 27% of us read the Bible a few times a week. 28% of us read the Bible every once in a while, which could range anything from once a week to once a month to a couple of times a year. 12% of us rarely or never read the Bible. If the absence of the sun is so destructive to the earth... How destructive to the human soul is the absence of the Word of God? How destructive is it to our church if 70% of us are essentially separated daily from the Word of God? I thought it was interesting that physicists said due to the distance of the sun that it takes about 8 minutes and 20 seconds for us to feel that gravitational bump or to notice the lights being turned off. And, And I've seen it through the years. How many Christians do we know that started so well, so excited? 
about the things that they were finding in church and in the Lord and in the Word of God. But then you begin to notice that spiritual temperature go down, and then maybe they just disappeared. Or maybe there was a cataclysmic error, and we all look at that, and we go, oh gosh, I wonder what happened. Really, the essential question ought to be, I wonder how long they've been separated from the Word of God. When did it really turn off in their life, but it's just taken us a while to notice? In his book, Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life, Donald Whitney says, there is no healthy Christian life apart from a diet of the milk and meat of Scripture. The sun is vital to the earth. The Bible is essential to the soul. Without it, you won't make it. But think about our strategy. Oh, I read the Bible a few times a week. I, I read it every once in a while. Let's apply that strategy to the sun. Today is a beautiful day. Gosh, isn't this like a chamber of commerce kind of a day for us? I mean, we, we couldn't ask for a better day than this. And let's imagine tomorrow is as beautiful as today. And after two great days in the sun, we go outside and we say, Son, we have had enough of you this week. And we just want to let you know that because you were so beautiful on Sunday and Monday, we're going to give you until Friday off. We don't really need you Wednesday and Thursday. I'll tell you what, son, we don't even need you Friday or Saturday. Why don't you come back next Sunday. How appropriate would that be? That's ignorant. You know why? Because 95% of the plant life on the planet would be dead in three days without the sun. How many of you, your strategy, I know this intermittent fasting is the thing that's going to make us all like awesome again, right? So what if your strategy for intermittent fasting was this? I will wake up tomorrow morning on Monday, and I will eat enough for breakfast tomorrow to last me the rest of the week. Think of how much time and money you're going to save from eating on Monday afternoon, Tuesday night. Hey, what are we going to eat on Wednesday? Who cares? We ate enough for breakfast on Monday. Mom doesn't even have to plan the menu. We don't even have to send lunch money with you guys because we're going to eat enough for breakfast tomorrow to last us the rest of the week. How many students are for that plan? That's what I thought. Listen, it's impractical. It's impossible. It's ridiculous. But how many of us, our strategy for the Word of God is, well, I heard it on Sunday, and I think I'm good for the rest of the week, so you'll go home today, you'll put your Bible up, you will not see it again till next Sunday if you feel good enough to come back to church. You don't eat that way. You will never have a vital relationship with God that way. Ever. It is spiritual starvation that leads to death. It won't work. To distance yourself from the Bible is to starve yourself from the things that you need to know God. Look at verse 10. How how wonderful is this? Listen, the Word of God is desirable. More to be desired are they than gold. The Word of God is valuable, even fine gold. The Word of God is enjoyable, sweeter than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. The Word of God is helpful. Moreover, by them is your servant Warned, the word of God is profitable. In keeping them, there is great reward. What is the impact of the word of God on the human soul? Look at verse 12. The word of God keeps you from hidden faults. Who can discern his errors? 
The Word of God, keep, he says, declare me innocent from hidden faults. The Word of God keeps us from making cataclysmic mistakes. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sin. Let them not have dominion over me. That word presumptuous is the same word used to describe a pot that is boiling that is eventually going to boil over. And how often do mistakes and sins in our life, there are things boiling inside of us. And it's hard to control ourselves, but the Word of God comes along and keeps us at check from presumptuous sin. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. It keeps our fellowship with God intact and that it keeps us from sin. And in verse 14, the most beautiful expression of what the Word of God does to the human soul, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. The Word, listen to me, the Word of God makes God personal. You will not hear Him speak. You will not see Him work. You will not experience God separate from the things that he has said, as essential as the sun is to the earth, the word of God is to your soul. What if the sun suddenly disappeared? The earth would freeze, the plants would die, the oceans would be ice, the planet would be a rock, there would be no life left. Gravitationally, there's no bearing for the planet to stay in its orbit without the sun. What if the Word of God were to suddenly disappear from your life? Your spiritual life is cold. There is no growth. Gravitationally, you are unhinged from the orbit of God. And so here we are in February, saying we want to emphasize the study of the Bible. And everybody goes, well, that's really good. That's a, that's a churchy thing to do. Listen to me. That's not what we're saying. What we are saying is this, Liberty, if we do not daily get in the Word of God... This church is cold, it has no life, and it is unhinged. It's that important. I should never have to stand here on a Sunday and bring a sermon called Seven Reasons You Need to Eat Every Day This Week. I'll, I'll never have to do that. General nutrition for the Christian soul. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day. It's essential for life. You know why? Because you get hungry. We ought to be starved for the Word of God. So we want to emphasize it this month. But man, we, we've got to do it. We, today, we need to be in the Word of God. Tomorrow, we need to be in the Word of God. We're providing things for, for us to do to, to get in the Bible. Devotions on the app. But man, here, you don't need a devotion. Just get in the Word of God. Read it. Begin to eat from it. Brian, some of it's hard to understand. Yes, it is. But just because there's some food you don't like, do you not eat any of it? Well, I don't like green stuff. Well, then you just say, I'm not going to eat any of it? No. Just because there's some parts in the Bible that are hard to understand doesn't mean you don't have to read any of it. And hey, check this out. If you'll just do the parts in the Bible that you do understand, it'll profoundly change your life. So let me encourage you to do this. Read all of it. The parts you don't understand go, wow, I'll figure that out later. But the parts that you do start there. It'll be amazing. 
And there's so many things that are so plain we can't understand in the Word of God. And I love one thing in particular we're going to be doing this month. On the 16th, in that worship service, we're going to hand you a card. And on that card is going to be about three to five chapters in the Word of God that we want you to read on that Thursday, that, that 20th. We're, we're calling that a day of feasting on the Word of God. And listen, if everybody who comes to church that day takes a card and reads the assigned passage on Thursday, you know what that'll mean? That'll mean the Liberty Baptist Church as a congregation read the entire Word of God in one day. That'll be so cool, won't it? And then we're going to come back that next Sunday on the 23rd, and we're going to celebrate that. But man, this is what I want to press you to. Just, just this one essential truth right here. As important as the sun is to the earth, so is the Word of God to your soul. Can I please persuade you to read it and study it every day. You need this. I need this. Without this, we are dark, cold, without growth, and spiritually unhinged. The Word of God is essential to your life. I want to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes with me for a moment. And we're going to offer an invitation, and it's going to be like this. Daryl's going to come in a few moments. He's going to take verses 7 through 11 or 14 and pray them over people in the altar because I know there's people in this room who need revived. There's people in this room trying to make decisions and we need wisdom. There's people in this room that are so sad and need joy. There's people in this room who are in darkness and we need enlightenment. Lord, there's people in this room we are about to waste away. But Lord, we come to the Word of God that endures forever. Lord, we have gone wrong and we know Your Word is right. Lord, make it sweet. Make it desirable. Keep us from presumptuous sin. We need that prayer over us today. And we're going to open up this altar. And you may have all kinds of different needs, but I want to tell you, every single need you have, you also need the Word of God in that need. So we're going to open up the altar, and we want to invite you to come and pray with us. Let us pray for you. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, Brian, I don't know the Lord. I need to be saved. I'm so convicted by the covenant of the new life He's given us in Christ, and I want to know Him. You come. We're going to have altar workers who will be here. They're going to stand down here. You can come meet one of them. If you don't come during the invitation, they're going to be still standing there after we dismiss. You go find them and talk to them about how to know the Lord. But I want to pray for you. And then I want us to beg, I want to beg us liberty. I want to beg us liberty. Let's feast on the Word of God this month. Every day. Heavenly Father, God, I pray you make us hungry and thirsty for righteousness that we may be filled. Lord, bring us back weeping and broken that we may be comforted. Lord, for those that have gone astray, God, I pray that you revive the soul and bring us back today. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand? Daryl's going to come.